So we have an artist from Berlin who has been the main man behind Atari Teenage Riot and multiple different other projects, Alec Empire. So please give him a warm welcome. <laughs> Like we always start in the beginning. So the beginning was Berlin, sometimes in the late 80s, early 90s. What was your musical first <laughs> encounter in Berlin? I mean, uh, I started in the punk scene okay. in the 80s. I was very young. I had this uh, kind of like a fun punk band called Die Kinder, and we opened up for bands like Die Toten Hosen and Ärzte and, you know, this kind of stuff. Okay. And when I was, I think, 15, I felt really disillusioned by punk, or the direction punk was taking at the time. It was very much about beer drinking and having fun or something, and I felt this... Having fun was to, not the aspect that you wanted to be involved yeah, with. Yeah, for me... Th the politics were missing, and it became kind of stupid, in my opinion. Um, so I was looking for other stuff. And I got really into uh, dub, you know, early 70s Jamaican dub music, stuff like that. Anything that was experimenting with uh, sound I was always more interested in sound rather than, you know, songwriting. You know, and for me, the punk scene at the time was always that kind of same formula, guitar, bass, drums, vocals, and people wrote songs. But to think about it, let's say, a new guitar sound, that wasn't really on the agenda. So, but then, you know, Acid House came up, and that uh, changed my life, basically. That was Acid 88. House, okay. But describe the music scene that you... Um grew up in. I mean, you said early on that it was a mixture between um, punk and techno. And usually people who listened to punk were really avoiding electronic elements. And the people who were doing techno, they were really focused on the electronic thing, but they never really listened to any guitar sounds. So how, what basically initiated that you were interested in those, both of those scenes? <laughs> I mean, you have to, I mean, now it, it, it's almost strange like when we look back and people can't imagine that it was like that um, at the time for us in the punk scene anything electronic anything to do with computers <laughs> was evil and commercial and you know like pop bands use computers and, and synthesizers and we thought that's horrible that's the devil it's going to dehumanize uh, music, you know, it's going to replace the musicians. And it's all going to sound like very artificial and dead. And sometimes now I think maybe there was some truth to that <laughs> when I listen to top 40 uh, pop music. Where you wonder like how much of the individual musician is left mm -hmm. in, in, in the music. You know, is it only manufactured? Is the role of, let's say, the, the artist just to be sort of like a, a, a logo, a brand, a visual? But there's something uh, that thing, you address you know? in your music as well, right? Sorry? I mean, that's something that you address in your music as well, the, um, the interaction with electronica and um, also a lot of the, um, how people use or being surveilled by electronics? I think, I mean, the 80s, and then of course the early 90s, for me, it was dominated by that conflict of like, you know, man versus machine. You know, I mean, we all know this from Kraftwerk and bands like that, but then what fascinated me wasn't really Kraftwerk, it was uh, the early hip hop stuff. And I always uh, thought this is amazing when you when you saw, let's say, Grandmaster Flash or people like that, Africa Bombarda, they made this electronic sound like very physical, in my opinion. And they, they even looked like that. You know, they looked like 70s funk musicians. You know, like they didn't wear shirts and they... 
an amazing outfit, like leather, you know, and it, it's, it, now it's almost unthinkable. I mean, maybe Kanye West tried to bring it back or something, but, it's, but at the time it was, that's what hip hop was about, you know. And what changed your mind in the end that basically computers are not so bad for making music? Yeah, that was, uh, of course, it was hip hop and um, also the early uh, acid house generation. That was something, uh, I didn't experience it in Berlin the first time. I went to the south of France and I uh, was invited to like a you know, very early kind of acid house party. And I've, first I didn't get it. I was one of these kids in school who was wearing the t-shirt, you know, with the, the smiley uh, was shot in the head. I don't know if you remember this uh, shirt. I hated all that. But when I witnessed the energy and the people, how they reacted to the music, that's when it clicked and I was like, okay, I get it. This is not like some sort of stupid like disco music or something. That's at the time, that's what we thought. You know, I thought this is all the same. Uh, I'm against it, you know, but there I understood, okay, that's a different thing. That's very, uh, it's almost like music that resisted the mainstream. I think for many reasons, it, it came out of the gay scene, for example. Um, and so it was like music of outsiders in the beginning, and I found that really uh, fascinating. And also, um, the music, it, it went against all the traditional rules of songwriting. You know, suddenly you didn't have that, you didn't have to follow these rules like, okay, you, you have this intro, and then the verse, and then the refrain, and then you have to do the second verse, and so on, you know? and I'm, I was so bored by that, by those rules, that you have to stick to those rules in order to get played on the radio and stuff. And then suddenly, uh, in DJ sets, you needed completely different music and you had to get rid of those rules. <laughs> so if you had a, a drum beat that was going, you know, for, I don't know, for like three minutes until the main track started, just for the DJ to, uh, you know, use it in a set, It, it just sounded way more exciting uh, because it was unpredictable. You know, I, that's always what I found uh, uh, great in music, if I couldn't exactly predict what's next, <laughs> you know. Do you think that's also important for your audience? Do you sometimes surpri want to just surprise people? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it's a balance. Um, Because as a musician, of course, you want to communicate something and you want people to react to your music. <laughs> so, I mean, I've done stuff like that where, you know, people were really mad and were throwing things at me and then everybody left the room and stuff. And <laughs> I sometimes like that confrontation. But I mean, of course, you need to find the right balance, you know, and I've... So you need to, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a mix of sort of like getting people to agree with what you're doing or liking it, but then also maybe surprising them, maybe, I don't know if educating people is the right word. I hate that kind of word, but the audience and the musician, I think what we want to do is like we want to experience something new, you know, like we don't want this to become a ritual where we repeat the same thing and then this is the end of the, the concert and da, da, da. you know, like I, I felt this was always not exciting, you know. But bringing a certain message across in your music is, all, is a big part, of, at least that's what I assume. So how would you rate how important it is to bring a message across next to the music that you're producing? Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there was a, a, a real uh, a point uh, in my life where, you know, I, I kind of uh, left the whole punk scene behind. That was like 89, something like that, maybe 88. But, you know, that doesn't happen from one day to the next. You know, it's not like, oh, suddenly now I, I like this and I hate everything that came before. You know, so you kind of, you know, slide into this other thing. Uh, um, so, but anyway, I thought a lot of the slogans of the 80s and the 70s and the 60s felt really uh, boring, uh, you know, at the end of the 80s. It was like, okay, this is kind of meaningless. If people don't think about those slogans or those messages um, that came mostly, I would say, out of the student protests um, and the political movements of the 70s, late 60s, 
then it becomes empty. It doesn't, yeah, you don't even achieve anything. If people just scream something or, or uh, go to a protest and repeat something they don't understand even or they haven't really thought about. But you then, delivered you know, kind of a soundtrack to certain protests as well. Yeah. I yeah, mean, but, leading but, also to the first May 1999 where you were yeah. uh, arrested for for one <laughs> on playing, playing on, a, on, a, on a wagon and um, the police took you. So... I guess it no, was a I mean, soundtrack I, for a certain movement, I guess. No, but I think that I'm talking about the beginning and what we wanted to do with techno is we wanted to get rid of all this kind of garbage from the old century, you know? But then there was a point where we thought, wait a minute, like, we have to take a stand here. Like, we have to say what we believe in. If we just do instrumental music, um, it can be hijacked by other people. And we saw that happening in the early 90s. Uh, uh, there were neo-Nazi organizations taking techno and calling it the first German music. And suddenly you felt like the scene that you came out of, you didn't have a lot in common with all these people because the, the, the bigger the scene grew, the more like, you know, weird people came into it. <laughs> and they were like, It wasn't so clear that you were all on the same wavelength. And there was a point where we were like, okay, now, uh, no, we, we have to say what we believe in because... I mean, for example, if you were at some of the, the early techno raves, in the early, like first half of the 90s in Berlin, and suddenly you would, would uh, uh, hear people talk bad about, for example, uh, uh, gays at these parties. You go like, uh, wait a minute, like this started in that scene. So what now you're a homophobe? You know, it doesn't make sense. Like you, you're coming here. <laughs> But then of course it, it exploded with the love parade and techno being commercialized. And of course you get really strange people <laughs> who represent the majority uh, who, yeah, who have, in my opinion, the wrong uh, conservative uh, worldviews. And so we decided, okay, we need to make music to, you know, fight the kind of extremists, but also to make clear to the sort of like political, political like middle ground or whatever you want to call it, No, we, we, we started this music to achieve something else, to bring change to society, or at least f to our lives, you know. How uh, would you describe your first musical setup that you started out with? Yeah, that, that was uh, the Atari computer. It was the Atari 1040 ST, um, which at the time everybody used, I think. Uh, it was... I mean, if you would talk to Public Enemy, for example, they would use it. You would see it maybe in, in photos of, like, I don't know, uh, when Madonna recorded a record. It was just the, like, the music computer. And <laughs> why? Why do you think that was? No, it was just because it has had a, a MIDI interface built in, and it was, it was just working. And um, towards the end of the 90s, PCs and Macs were replacing the Atari. But your project Atari Teenage Ride was, I guess, based on that machine. Mm. And uh, you still claim to produce most of the music on that machine? For Atari Teenage Ride. <laughs> just for Atari Teenage Ride. Okay, so you're still following that rule to yeah. use that as the main machine. Yes, that's the, that's the fun about it. That's why we're doing this music. <laughs> Because it becomes uh, a real pain. <laughs> If you just have two megabyte RAM and copy and paste is like not really possible. And, and I, I mean, there's so much. I mean, any phone is more powerful than this thing. So, but I mean, a journalist, I think it was from Wired or something, asked me once, like a few years ago, so why using this machine? It's like, if you can f take a fly to America, why, why would you want to swim there, you know? And I was like, yeah, because... It's part of the challenge to produce an album with that, I yeah, guess. I guess. So I, I guess we have to explain that we sometimes get a bit geeky about production techniques here at CDR, because mm. this is mostly or also f focused on producing music. Um, so yeah, um, 
that was Atari Teenage, right? You just released an album um, last week, I guess, with Atari Teenage, right? Um, we're going to talk about maybe another project that you did 20 years ago, actually, which was um, the Low on Ice album, um, an, an album that was recorded um, during a festival. Um, maybe you can explain what was what was happening and how you recorded that. Yeah, I mean, I was on tour uh, with the band, uh, a Titanus ride, and we played on Iceland. There was a festival where Bjork and Prodigy and like us from the 90s, you know, <laughs> everybody was. <laughs> it looks like a dream lineup of the 90s when you look at this poster now. Um, but anyway, so all the artists decided, okay, they're going to go back to a hotel that, you know, was provided. Uh, uh, after the show and stay in Reykjavik uh, because the festival was like in nature somewhere outside and uh, I decided to just stay in a tent you know it was for three days and I had the same equipment with me um, that we used to you know that we used on stage with the Thai Teenage Riot very minimal equipment uh, and I decided in the tent to record music and because uh, it was too cold or No, it was just, I mean, I have to say, like, sometimes, like, I could have hung out backstage and go to the after party and stuff, but um, this can be sometimes so boring if you do this all the time. <laughs> so I, I just felt like, why do exactly the same thing that we do everywhere else if you're in this great environment, you know, like, and I also felt it was, Iceland is a magical place. Uh, it is a real... Uh, intense place for some reason I mean it's hard to describe but when you when you're there it, it is something that I think you can't fake that for example in the studio you know you can imagine maybe certain landscapes and stuff like that and you, but if you're uh, in a certain space that's special it does something with you and it's great that you can use music to kind of yeah like keep a keep a record of that you know it's almost like taking a photograph or something or filming something so you basically recorded the atmosphere of the place and then uh, no, no no i made music in the place okay. but i was like the um the medium <laughs> the medium you were absorbing <laughs> the energy no, no i okay. mean i'm exaggerating but i mean the thing is this For many people, this album was like so different from everything else I did that after you know 20 years now, people said there must have been something. Why is this record sounding so different? You know, so and many people say this is the only good record you made. So <laughs> it's you know all the other stuff you can forget. I mean, there are some people who hate that record because it's kind of slow and very cold sounding and. Uh, um, But yeah, so I don't know. It, it, there was a moment, I guess, that was uh, recorded. And you also got some visuals by an artist that basically accompanied that project, or did that happen afterwards? No, this is like, um, I was asked by a Club Transmediale to do a show uh, in January. Um, they were like, hey, could you maybe perform this album? Because I never performed it live. We put this out on a vinyl record at the time, and I thought, okay, this is some bizarre record like nobody or maybe only a few people will care about it and then year after year I met more people who kind of discovered it and liked it because there was like no promotion or anything like that done for this it was released <coughs> on the Mille Plateau uh, album uh, uh, label sorry uh, it was a, a kind of like a When I look back now, an important label, because it was that moment when we were bored with the techno scene and we started to think more outside the box and we were looking at French philosophy and the pioneers of electronic music like Musique Concrete, you know, like all that kind of, you know, pre-1970 uh, electronic music. And we wanted to break out of that pattern of just producing for DJs, you know, because it, there was a point in the mid-90s where you just felt, it was like, we called it the pleasure prison. <laughs> so you, you had to follow those rules and then people were going crazy at the raves and it, it became a, a formula that 
it felt like you were in chains. You know, a lot of But musicians felt like that. Isn't it still today a little bit also for a lot of people who produce music for clubs that they have to please a certain mm. audience? Would you agree? Yeah, it, that, that's a, I think that's a problem. I mean, it depends. Like, if you want to do that, sometimes I like to do that too. But I think when the moment comes as a musician when you feel forced into something and you have totally different ideas, it, that's sad. And I think basically how Spotify and iTunes and YouTube is a good example, the architecture of those platforms keeps people in that little, I don't know, chamber. Like you, it's very hard to break out. I see it all the time. If I have to put a category, a music category, uh, if I have to fill out some form or something online, it doesn't quite fit. And then, of course, you, you have something that doesn't fit, and then you have that audience who's just searching for, let's say, dubstep or something, and they come across low on ice, and they get really mad, and they go, this is not dubstep, this is not Skrillex, you know, and you get all this hate, and you go, yeah, well, it's... Uh, the technology kind of prevents it, <laughs> because music doesn't work like that. You know, I think music, that, the, the categories were invented by the music industry, you know, to have basically shelves in a record store. <laughs> so no musician sits there and goes, okay, I'm going to... Uh, uh, Do something a, for that shelf. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, later on, you, you maybe go, okay, I fit into that category. But very often, I think it's sad because record labels often, that's what they do, I think. They try to polish or shape the artist in a way that they f do fit in the end. A, a very defined category. And I think this way we're missing out on, yeah, uh, music that is special, that doesn't quite fit in. I mean, I was always a big music fan of, of music that doesn't, didn't fit. You know, that, that, that was just always, that had this extra thing that It's maybe because it you originated your own genre as well, and I guess you know what it's like to fight for your own sound. Maybe before we get, cover that topic, we should, also, we should watch the, um, and hear the sound that you did for this Low on Ice project, because we oh, already okay. kind of moved on. Um, but I think it's, it's something special um, that people should check out. It's an analog video. Maybe you can just explain how the video was created as well and how you worked with that yeah. artist and I'll try to plug up the other computer. Okay, so why you do that, I do that. Yeah, there's a, a, a visual artist. Uh, he's called Zan Lyons. Um, we've worked on various projects before. Uh, he uh, came from London. He lives now in Berlin. And... We decided for the live shows that I'm doing for this, um, yeah, there should be visuals. But then we were facing the first uh, challenge, and that is like, how do you come up with visuals that are not like, you know, when you see bands doing, or like musicians do it like a sort of ambient set, and very often it's like digital uh, uh, visuals, and it, I personally never really felt a, a lot uh, when I watched those types of shows. Um, so Zan, I think when he applied the, the method of low on eyes, which was very analog to his visuals, and I thought that was really interesting. So doing the shows, I'm not really visible that much. It's mostly the visuals. I mean, it's, it should be maybe completely dark and <laughs> I don't know if it works in the same way, but you should maybe check it out anyway.
right at Berghain, I think a lot of people felt that feeling of isolation that we want to get across, which is now maybe, you know, you have to kind of set it up and I don't know if it works like that here now, but whatever. <laughs> it was a try. Okay. <laughs> but talking of high definition, actually, um, I guess a lot of people always get the impression that a certain lo-fi aspect is very essential to your music. Um, is it really that lo-fi? Do you sit in the studio and say, okay, it has to be 8 bits or it has to, be, has to have a certain noise element in it? I don't really care about those categories. Um, I think it's more important to capture an energy and, or an atmosphere, you know? Um, so whatever it takes. So let's say if you have, if you work with the vocalist and there's like a great take and it's, it's maybe, you know, the, the vocalist wasn't holding the microphone perfect or was not in the perfect position like this maybe, or, you know, was like moving, doing the take, but it has the right energy, I would keep that, you know, while a lot of other producers would go, no, actually you have, we have to do this again. And if you, I noticed with a lot of musicians, the more you repeat something, the more, It becomes a routine, you know, it becomes, it loses some of that spontaneous energy. And I think if there's one advantage of digital technology, then it's maybe that we can just afford to take those risks and, uh, yeah, do takes like that, you know, also maybe at different times of the day or, you know, it's, but of course you could also use it in the wrong way that you keep editing it and over you know, correcting it and, and then you lose that again, you know, so I'm not really a friend of that. And I think for some people that's the category of like lo-fi or something because it's not polished. So is the, uh, the way you produce music uh, with Atari Teenage a lot different than your own solo projects? Yeah. very different. Why? Uh, it's just, I mean, first of all, with the Atari computer, um, When you, I mean, when you listen to a Thai teenage ride, a lot of people, the first association uh, they make is punk right? or something like that. They go, oh, that's like techno punk, or, you know, it's like chaotic and da da da. And then there's a mosh pit at the live shows. And, but, and then, of course, you get the more like, I call it the bourgeois music press. <laughs> who <laughs> they always, they feel kind of threatened or they hate it because. They think it's people letting go and they're not in control and there's something in our Western European culture people are a little bit afraid of, uh, you know. So, but people forget that we program the stuff on an Atari computer. So whenever you hear a track that sounds very kind of violent and crazy or whatever, Uh, it might cause this effect with a listener or a, a, an audience at the show, but it's actually, in most cases, me going, okay, I'm really angry about some topic, <laughs> some corruption or some, some war or something, but then I have to actually take a deep breath, sit down and start typing. And, and the beautiful thing about an Atari computer is like you can, you can really hit the, the keyboard very hard it doesn't make any difference. So it's like, it doesn't sound harder the more you punch it, you know? Uh, it's like, I think if you come from a more traditional band setup, it's like the louder, or more aggressive music sounds, the harder people play the instruments. And in Atari Teenage right? that's just not the case. So a lot of the times it's like, okay, this has to be, that, that has to sound like chaos. So how do we make it sound like chaos? <laughs> And there's like a whole other level of thinking behind it, but I don't actually want people to hear that. It should sound at the end like chaos. It was actually developed from this uh, poem by uh, William S. Burroughs. Uh, he wrote this thing, Riot Sounds Produce Riots, where you basically take sounds um, of a real riot and you play them back maybe in a shopping mall or something like that, and you simulate a riot because people hear the sound and they there's a large crowd of people and they don't know where it's coming from and then they go okay wait, wait a minute like that somebody called the police there's something going on like a fight or somebody's smashing some windows and then later on uh, uh, the police might actually come 
and then people react to it and people will get arrested and you simulated a riot but there was never actually a real riot in the first place so that's the whole concept about this group which carries a sense of humor in it which some people fail to see sometimes <laughs> so. so would you say that the music um, you create in the studio is made for the live show or is the live show inducing the music that is later on captured in an album it's both um, for me it's always because I was always also a DJ and I created that sound first as a DJ uh, I was uh, playing like hardcore rave records at the time it was like 1991 and then I did a set at the Electro uh, Club uh, I don't know if people still remember it and there was a moment where it was just never enough it was like the crowd wanted more energy. And I started to mix in uh, old punk records. So that was bands like X-Ray Specs or Ramones or Sex Pistols, stuff like that. And in order to match the tempo, I didn't want to pitch down the punk records because that was not the energy I wanted. So I had to bring up the tempo uh, from the electronic records. So that's why a lot of that early digital hardcore stuff or a Teenage Riot stuff, was at 180, 190 BPM already, which now is maybe a lot of people are used to these, this kind of tempo uh, from hardcore maybe or drum and bass or stuff like that. But at the time, most electronic music that was played in clubs was at maximum 135 BPM. <laughs> so for a lot of people at the time, it was like information overflow. They were like, Uh, sorry, man. Like I don't get it. This is like watching my, a movie. My feet are not doing this for me. Sorry. My feet are not doing this for me. No, they. Th the weird thing was, it was more like the feet were moving, but pe people's brains couldn't <laughs> process it fast enough. But I think there's something about electronic music that I always found fascinating. That is actually how much can the brain process? You know what I mean? It's like you. There are certain sounds you need to understand them. It's like language in a way. You need to follow them, you need to keep listening to them. And then at some point you go, why did this sound even new to me? Like, I totally get it, you know? And I think we all know that moment from electronic music. I wanted to ask um, what equipment you used in the tent in Ireland that you made the... In Iceland? Yeah, in Iceland. Yeah. Ireland and Iceland are two different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, okay. man. I can exactly tell you, it was an 808 drum machine a 303, a 101, and then there was a TR-909, but the I used that as a, a how you say, a, it was the center, it was like the master clock, basically, the other machines. I mean, sometimes when I speak about it, people say, I don't hear a 909 on the record. That's true, because I didn't want that sound on the record. Um, Uh, a hardware sampler, which was the Akai S1000. And let me think, yeah, like a, a tiny reverb was an Alesis, uh, uh, the, I think the MIDI Verb 3, stuff like that. So it was something that would fit on this table and a, um, a tape machine I had at the time. So yeah, that was the setup. And so you recorded the full album in the tent? Or you yes. later? Yes. It was like I just kept making music and recording it. So, and then later on, I mean, we're gonna re-release or not really re-release. We released the the full recording session in a way now um, because at the time it's now it's like three CDs. At the time it was like one CD because with the label we had this. Just these uh, debates about it. it was like a lot of stuff that that just was too I mean considered too far out there at the time people were like look man this is nobody can dance to this and this is like really slow and oh my god you know you can't do this you know like and when I listened back to the tapes I thought actually it makes perfect sense I mean It's kind of strange because people tell me there's something about it because the music was never so trendy or something that, or hip or, or so, that it's, it became a little bit timeless maybe. 
because it wasn't part of a trend. So people don't know where to place it. You know, they go, this could have been maybe recorded in 2001 or 1998 or, or something like that. Or even later, maybe. I mean, some people think it's like some of the early dubstep uh, uh, from England, that kind of stuff. But it, it's not. So I think that's another good thing about music. I think if you, as a musician, maybe try to find your own space, like your own sound, and don't follow any trends. Sometimes you can be quite lucky because, yeah, it, it, it just, it becomes timeless or people can listen to it in any other context and don't know, you know what I mean? They, they don't know where to place it. So that's something maybe to keep in mind sometimes. So, so I guess you had power in the tent or with better? Uh, yeah. So, sorry, yeah, I have to explain that. Um, it was like this, there was the festival site and then there was uh, like a mountain kind of, I mean not like a huge mountain, but more like a hill. <laughs> and so I had a power line going through where my tent was. But so, yeah, it was when it was like empty and stuff, the, the festival site, there was like, I don't know, one kilometer or something like that. I wasn't like on my own. Sometimes people think I was on my own in the snow somewhere, you know, like it, it took like three hours to get to human civilization. It wasn't like that. But still, you can feel kind of isolated and alone, even though if there's a festival very far in the back, I don't know if you know that feeling. <laughs> There are a lot of people, but yeah, you, you don't feel really feel connected, so. So I guess it's an album that definitely people should check out to see a different side of your musical spectrum. So want. we talked a lot about Atari Teenage Rides and you, I think, brought us a video of the new... I mean, we could also just play a track of a CD. Yeah, sure. So what should we play? Um, you just, I mean, okay, play track four, maybe. story behind it I was given a book uh, um, by a hacker and it was called uh, uh, IBM and the Holocaust and it was about how the um, the Nazis used technology basically to speed up the killings of Jewish people and you know the concentration camps and all that stuff we wrote the song because I think there's always that that question when people work on technology, on new technology, it always has that perfect, like, you know, great image, like, it will make the world better, but a lot of people working on that stuff are not really political people, and they might end up doing something that will harm maybe people. You know, I think this is a lot, a lot of people who uh, 
work on technology, suddenly it, it ends up in the, in the military or something. And uh, we thought this was a good inspiration uh, for a song. We have time for one more question, if there's one in the audience. What's your political standing now? How do you feel about corporate brands behind your back? Very early on, I had this, this like principle that I kept following. Um, never let any of that stuff influence your music. I think, and that's, I, I felt this was a good way to make my way through this <laughs> kind of horrible world. Like, no, because like, if you play shows, if you, I don't know, you, you appear somewhere, your music appears somewhere, like on the internet, you know, there's always some evil person who wants to place an ad next to it. <laughs> so I don't see a problem with that as long as I don't, I'm not forced to change what I do. And I was in situations like that, where, you know, we played, would play some festival stage and some, I don't know, some drink or some, some company would sponsor it and then, They were like, ah, can you maybe not play that one song where you speak about police brutality, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, like, we're here to play that song. So you can take your ad off if you don't want it next to uh, our performance. Try to control where your music appears and don't make compromises. Is I this guess okay? Like, does this answer your question? Okay. Uh, I hope you'll be sticking around as well if there's anyone in the audience who has uh, further questions as well. So, thanks for being here. Thanks for yeah. sharing some thoughts. And, uh, yeah, thanks for coming to CDR Berlin. So, we'll take a short break. Or yeah. First, Thank you. give it up for Alex. Yeah.